Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at geologic time. So in this video we're going to be focusing on fossils and this is going to correspond to section 9.5 of your textbook. So the first question we obviously need to deal with is why are fossils helpful to geologists? Well, fossils are useful, number one, because they occur within sedimentary rocks. And as we've already discussed, in terms of trying to get an absolute age for sedimentary rocks, it's quite difficult. We can't use radiometric dating. So fossils offer us a method through which we can get at least a possible range of ages during which our layer of sedimentary rock could have formed. So how do we do this? Well the nice thing about fossils is when we look at them we can see that fossils have a first and last point at which they occur in the geologic record and this uh, range of time during which this fossil existed is referred to, referred to as its range. And obviously the range begins the first time we see the fossil in the rock record and the range finishes the last time we see the fossil in the fossil record. Now these ranges can vary in length depending on what species you're looking at. Some species exist in the rock record for only relatively short periods of time so their range is something like 100,000 years. There are other species in the fossil record that have, have very, very large ranges, which in the, are in the order of hundreds of millions of years. So these ranges aren't the same for each species. Some species have quite small ranges and some species have very, very large ranges. Now, the most important thing is, is that when we find a fossil in our layer of rock, what we can do is we can go to the fossil record and we can say, right, I've identified the species and I know this species existed between, let's say, the early Carboniferous and the late Permian. That therefore means that the layer of rock that contains this particular fossil must therefore have formed sometime between the early Carboniferous and the late Permian. Now obviously that's quite a large range consisting of you know a few hundred million years. But nevertheless, it has helped us to constrain the age of our bed, and it's given us an approximate numerical range during which that bed could have formed. Now, if we get super lucky and we get one of those fossils that has a very, very short range, let's say 100,000 years or maybe a few million years, that means we can actually date the rock very, very accurately because that particular fossil didn't, you know, wasn't around for very long, and so its occurrence in the rock record is very, very limited. So those are the best fossils for dating layers of rock. So I think you can agree that fossils are extremely helpful to geologists, especially when we're dealing with sedimentary rocks, which otherwise would be quite difficult to date because, of course, as we've discussed, radiometric dating doesn't really work with sedimentary rocks. So what are the different types of fossils that we have? Well, fossils are split into three broad groups. There are body fossils, trace fossils and molds and casts. So a body fossil is essentially a fossil that represents the body of the organism. That could be a plant or an animal. A trace fossil is a fossil that essentially is a trace of that organism having existed. So that would be something like a footprint. And a mold or a cast is essentially a specifically shaped void that's left in the rock when the fossil is destroyed. And I'll show you a picture in a couple of seconds time, which is going to help to illustrate that. So in terms of fossils, the type of fossils we're most familiar with are body fossils, and these can consist of the, the whole body of the animal, or they can consist of simply bones or part of the animal. Now, body fossils are split into two subgroups, altered and unaltered body fossils. So unaltered body fossils are fossils which essentially have their original composition. So think of animals that maybe get frozen and, and they get in, encased in permafrost and you know and then a few thousand years later the permafrost melts and then the animal gets exposed and essentially the carcass looks like it did the day the animal died. Or maybe you could think of an animal that gets mummified so although the organism itself has dried out, so it's lost water, the, to all intents and purposes, the organism is intact. It hasn't been altered. So those would be examples of unaltered body fossils. In terms of examples of altered body fossils, these are fossils where the original material has been replaced by a new mineral. So a classic example of that would be something like pyritization. 
and this is a process during which calcium carbonate gets replaced by the mineral pyrite, which is iron sulfide, sometimes referred to as fool's gold. And so you can obviously see that, you know, the, the, the fossil itself has a very shiny appearance to it because it's made of this pyrite. And so you can look at it and you go, right, well, that's obviously not the original mineral this particular fossil was made from. So I know it's been altered. The most important thing is that in both altered and unaltered body fossils, the shape, the morphology of the fossil itself isn't really affected. So if you have a bone and it's unaltered, it looks like the original bone. If you have an altered body fossil, it will still look like the original bone. So even if the material changes, we can still get useful information from the fossil. So the first thing is, is, well, how are fossils preserved? So what the most important thing about most fossils is that it tends to be the hard parts of the fossil which are preserved. And so this means there's an instant bias. So the bias is if your body has a majority or at least a portion of it, which consists of hard materials, you are more likely to be fossilized compared to an organism that has no hard body parts. So for instance, if we look at this picture here, we can quite clearly see that we have uh, several bivalves. You can see there are the shells there. And if you think of something like a dinosaur skeleton, once again, the skeleton itself counts as a hard part. On the other hand, think of something like a sea cucumber, which is you know, nothing but soft body parts. Sea cucumbers do not fossilize well because there are no hard parts to the body. And so, as I said, there's this instant bias in the fossil record towards organisms that have hard body parts, be they shells or skeletons. So the most important thing is that when your organism dies, you obviously have to get it buried in sediment before the fossil has time to get damaged because the longer the organism is exposed after it dies, the more likely it is to get damaged and therefore the more likely you are to lose the fossil. So another, another part of an organism which we tend to find are the bones. So once again, hard body parts tend to fossilize more easily. So shells and bones, tend to be quite common fossils. So in this particular one, we actually have a skeleton of what appears to be a mammoth. You can actually see the teeth right there. So this is obviously the skull. But in both cases, you can see we have the organism itself. We have the organism's body. In this case, in the form of the shell, and in this case, in the form of the skeleton. So both of these are examples of body fossils. We also have replacement. So this is going to be an example of an altered fossil. So we can quite clearly see here what we have is a tree trunk which has been petrified. So in this case what's happened is is the organic molecules, so that's molecules like lignin and uh, other such uh, organic proteins which are present in the original uh, tree, have been replaced by silica, SiO2. And so that's resulted in the formation of, the pet of this petrified uh, stump which we can see right here. So this is an example of an altered body fossil. So it still has the original shape of the tree stump, but the material that it's made from is not the original material. So the original carbon-based molecules have been replaced by silica. So this is an example of molds and casts, and this is the third type of fossil which we spoke about earlier. So in this case, what you can see is we have ourselves a layer of limestone and you can see this limestone has numerous voids in it. And if we look carefully, especially at this one here and this one here, you will notice that these voids actually represent locations where fossils used to be. So you can see there's an imprint of a shell right here and you can see there's another imprint of a shell right here. So clearly during the lithification process, uh, during which the sediment is being turned into a rock, the fossils which were here have been destroyed. And this is a relatively common thing which happens uh, during lithification. So the destruction of the fossils means that what we end up with is we end up with a fossil shaped void in our layer of rock. This is the mold. Now, what can happen later is we can get minerals precipitating within the, uh, the, the mold, or we can get sediment filling the mold. And this sediment or the minerals will take on the shape of the mold and they will form a cast. So essentially a cast is a, uh, a reproduction of the fossil, but it's not actually the original fossil.
And so the formation of uh, molds and casts is actually relatively common. So a lot of the time when you're looking at fossils of animals like trilobites or a lot of mollusk fossils, what you're actually looking at is not the original fossil. It's actually a cast of a mold that was left in a rock. We can also have fossils being preserved as thin films of material. And this is relatively common uh, with fossils which occur in muddy sediments. So in these muddy sediments, what tends to happen is you tend to get organisms being trapped between these very, very thin layers of muddy sediment that get deposited in low energy environments. So think of an environment a bit like a lake or a lagoon. And so as these muddy sediments uh, get compressed, what happens is, is the rock begins to get heated up. So it's obviously going through the process of lithification. Now, what can happen is, is your fossil can essentially begin to be baked. So think of an example of uh, baking a pizza in your oven at home. Now, it's not uncommon that when you're baking a pizza in your oven at home, if you put it straight on the rack, a little bit of cheese might melt and fall off the side of your pizza and end up in the bottom of your oven. And so what do you do? Being the responsible person you are, you leave it. And so you leave that piece of cheese in the bottom of your oven and you use your oven a dozen, two dozen, three dozen times. So you're constantly baking and rebaking that bit of cheese. And eventually we know that piece of cheese turns into a lump of you know, nothing but carbon. And the same thing happens with these fossils. So they're trapped in the muddy sediment and the muddy sediment is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And so what happens is, is a lot of the uh, compounds which are part of the fossil get driven off. So the heat event, you know, initially gets rid of the water, then it starts to burn off the nitrogen compounds, then it starts to burn off the sulfur compounds. And eventually everything gets burnt away with the exception of the carbon. And so what gets left behind is essentially a fossil that consists of a very, very thin film of carbon along a bedding plane. Now, these images, these, these thin sheets of carbon can be extremely detailed. I mean, if we look at this particular fossil here, you can actually see the individual veins which are part of the leaves. So we've, you know, so the fossil itself might have been destroyed, but we can still have quite a high level of detail. And this is a particularly common process, especially when we have plant fossils in low energy environments, as I said. So think of a, a leaf falling into a lake or a lagoon. We are very likely to get very muddy sediments, and the muddy sediments will very often have these plant fossils in them, which will consist of these carbonized films. Another type of fossil we can get is an impression. Now, I'm going to be honest, this particular image isn't the best example of an impression because, yes, it does have the impression produced by the fish's body, but it also has the skeleton as well. So it's actually technically a body fossil. But nevertheless, impressions can be extremely helpful. So impressions are one of the, way, one of the ways in which we can preserve soft bodied organisms. So think of that sea cucumber that we would we touched on for a few seconds at the beginning of the presentation. So a sea cucumber, because it doesn't have any hard body parts, is less likely to successfully fossilize compared to something like an oyster, which has a hard shell. Now, sometimes what will happen is, is our soft bodied organism will become incorporated into the sediment. So it will become part of a layer of mud. And then as a new layer of mud gets deposited on, deposit on top, the animal gets squished, but its body leaves an impression in the muddy sediment. And this impression gets filled in by sediment and preserved. Now, the body of the organism itself will decay and be lost, but the impression will persist. And so we can find the impressions and they can give us, you know, some idea about, you know, how the how the organism was designed. So if we look at this particular fossil of a fish right here, you can see straight away the impression has quite clearly left the outline of the fish. So it's given us a level of detail which we may otherwise not have. So we can see the skeleton of our fish here, we can see there's the skull, and we can see the spinal column coming down here. But it gives us a lot more detail than we would normally expect. So for instance, you can see the rays of 
the fins, both the fins at the front and the fins at the rear. Now these raids consist of very, very thin pieces of bone and they're very easily damaged and lost to the fossil record. So the fact they've been preserved by the impression gives us a level of information which we otherwise wouldn't have. Impressions can sometimes be extremely detailed to the point where you may even be able to see individual scales on the body of the organism, in this case a fish. So impressions are very, very helpful because they sometimes give us a window into the animal which we otherwise wouldn't have. So imagine if we just had the fish's skeleton, we wouldn't have this detail of exactly how the body looked, how the fins looked, how, and maybe if we're lucky enough to get a really good impression, it may even give us some idea about how the scales were orientated, for instance. Now here we have a fossil which has been preserved in amber. So this is once again is going to be a body fossil, but this is going to be an example of an unaltered body fossil because the organism that's been encased in the amber hasn't decayed. It hasn't broken down. It hasn't changed over time. And so in here we have the original organism preserved within the amber. Now, the great thing about amber is that it's antibacterial. So essentially, if anything does try to you know, grow on and, and destroy the fossil itself, the amber will uh, will kill it. So, uh, yeah, so this is an example of a um, an unaltered body fossil. Now, in terms of fossils preserved in amber, because amber tends to be a relatively easily damaged material, the oldest fossils preserved in amber tend to come all the way back from the Cretaceous. So that's part of the Mesozoic. However, we don't have a huge amount of material from before that time because fossil is uh, because amber isn't a particularly robust material. And so it's very easily damaged and very easily lost from the rock record. The final type of fossil which we might get are constructed features, and these are arguably an example of a trace fossil. So here we have an example of what's well, a bit difficult to see given this particular picture, but it could be algal mats or it could be stromatolites. So what you can see is we have a sequence of rocks where we have lots and lots of very, very fine layers. Now, these fine layers have been constructed due to the presence of photosynthesizing bacteria. So what you've got is you've got a layer of photosynthesizing bacteria which are happily doing their thing, they're living in the sea, they're sitting on the rock, they're photosynthesizing away, everything is good. But over time, this layer of bacteria will eventually, uh, the layer of bacteria will eventually get covered in sediment. And then once that layer of bacteria gets covered over by sediment, a new layer of bacteria will then develop over the top of the new layer of sediment. And then the process gets repeated again. The new layer gets covered over by sediment and then a newer layer gets a bacteria to come forms over the top. Then that newer layer gets covered with sediment and then an even newer layer of bacteria gets deposited. And so you can see over time, you're going to build up layer after layer after layer of sediment, which is formed by each new layer of bacteria developing on top of the sediment. And so this is eventually is going to produce what we refer to as a constructed feature. So the second type of fossil are of course going to be trace fossils. So if you remember, we have body fossils, which is the body of the organism itself. We have molds and casts, and we also have trace fossils. So a trace fossil essentially is an indication of the animal having existed. So in this particular instance, you can quite clearly see we have ourselves a footprint. So you can see we have one toe here, one toe here, and one toe here, and the heel is going to be located right here. So you might think to yourself, well, okay, that's nice. It shows us there was something moving around, but what can it actually tell us? Well, trace fossils are actually extremely helpful things. So straight away, we can look at this and we can see, well, right, well, these toes are clearly ending in rather noticeable triangular points, which would suggest claws. So straight away, this would hint that what we're looking at is the fossil of a predator. We can also get other details from this. So if we're lucky, we may actually be able to get an imprint of the bottom of the foot itself, a really accurate imprint. And this will obviously give us some idea about how the foot of this organism was designed. We can also look for other things. So at the most superficial level, we can see was this animal uh, uh, bipedal or quadrupedal? Did it move on two or four legs? We can also get some idea of the animal's stride. You know, did it you know, have a big stride or did it have a small stride? Every time it took a step how much distance did it cover typically the bigger the animal the larger the stride will be 
We can also look at other features such as how deep the impression is to also give us some idea um, about, uh, about how heavy the animal was. And we can also look at the shape of the footprint to see if the animal was just walking at a normal regular pace or whether the animal in question was running. You know, was it being chased by something or was it trying to chase something? And so there's lots of information that we can actually get from trace fossils, which is extremely helpful. Other forms of trace fossils are things like burrows. So we can quite clearly see here, we have a rock that consists of numerous overlapping burrows all, all over each other. Now, this is quite nice because it obviously shows us the organic activity. The problem is, of course, is that the formation of these burrows has destroyed the original geologic structures. So let's say for argument's sake, this was a mudstone. And in that mudstone, we had some nice thin laminated muds. Well, that particular geologic structure will be destroyed as the sediment gets gets churned up due to all this burrowing, but you know, that's a relatively minor problem. So the presence of trace fossils is extremely helpful to geologists. So even if we don't have the original fossil, we can still sometimes use the trace fossil to date the rock. So for instance, if we can work out which particular species of dinosaur, for instance, formed this footprint, we can use this footprint to date this particular layer of sediment. If we can work out what species of worm formed this burrow, then once again, we can use the trace fossil to date the layer of sediment. So trace fossils can also be used for dating evidence, as well as body fossils and molds and casts. All right, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.